All right, so welcome everybody. Um, my name is uh, Matthias Madu. Um, today I would like to talk about um, software security problems, uh, how we find them in solutions, um, what the process is within companies to get them to developers and how developers uh, get them fixed uh, essentially and eventually. Um, so today it's, it's not a technical talk. So I, I looked through my slides and I found one slide with, with code on there. So just so you know, it's, it's not a technical talk. It's really about um, what do we do de these days within organizations, within companies, with problems, with bugs. Um, what is the state of the tools that we're using? Um, how do we want to get developers to fix problems in code? And, and why does it not really work today? Um, so that's a little bit the subject that I would like to touch on. So who are we? Um, I'm, I'm Matthias Madu. Um, I founded a company called Sensei Security uh, six months ago. Before that, I, um, I spent seven years at Fortify NHP working on static analysis solutions, um, also on runtime solutions. Uh, in the beginning, three and a half years roughly on, on static analysis solutions because my background uh, I was I was at university doing code obfuscation with static analysis solutions. So eventually I moved over to Fortify, which was doing static analysis for other purposes, finding SQL injection, cross-site scripting, and, and a, a ton of other problems in code through static analysis. Um, after seven years, I really wanted to see what our solution was really doing in the field, so I moved over to consulting, um, working with financial institutions through a company called Inviso out of Belgium. Um, so we were serving the financial institutions. I looked into static analysis solutions. Um, why did they work in organizations? And mainly, why did they not work in, in organizations? So what was the problem to get developers to fix problems in code? And, and why are they keeping introducing new problems into code? Um, other stuff, BSIM, building security and maturity model. Um, I was heavily involved four or five years ago where we ran around in Europe. We talked to organizations like, hey, what does work for you? What does not, for work, what, what does not work for you within your organization? And I think um, the problems we're trying to solve um, is, is very similar of what we've seen in BSIM. Static analysis solutions are hard. Uh, we find a ton of problems, but getting them fixed and, and making sure developers do not introduce um, new problems in code is, is very, very hard. Um, I, I like to speak at conferences, um, Black Hat, DEF CON, RSA. We've, we've talked at uh, pretty much all conferences or interesting conferences. So that's it, that's it about me. Um, now I'm actually wondering um, who you guys are um, because it's, it's also much more interesting to have a feel for the audience, like, like hey, what are you guys interested in? So, so first things, like who is a student over here who's still studying? Um, here in... in um, the area, let's say, or, or um, within Netherlands, maybe. Um, so do you guys see a lot of security, application security, or is it like crypto? Because that's what we see in other organizations. Like in other universities, they, they teach crypto, and that's pretty much it. Do you see application security? Do we know about SQL injection? From university? OK, good. Ah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's another A this year. Okay, good. <laughs> so, um, who, who's consultant over here? Who's a, a software security consultants? Pretty much all of you guys, software security consultants. Um, and who is an employee in an organization doing software security? Okay. I seem to miss a couple of people. What what other jobs are here that that are not on there? Security operations center, financial institution. Okay, security operations center. Okay, thanks. Any others? Security architects. Oh, security architects. Okay, yes. Security architects. Within the organization or as a consultant? In the development department. In the development department. Okay. Any other architects? Software security architects in the development department? You're a rare species. Yeah. <laughs> um. Okay, so, so who's the developer over here? Any developers? Oh, good. Um, uh, so you're a developer and you keep software security in mind or you're kind of the satellite for software security but also doing some development? Uh, well, we work uh, at a company which develops uh, 
software which has to be secure. Yeah. Okay. So we have to keep uh, security stuff in mind. Ah, okay, 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 okay. You're you're really you're developing, but at the same time you're also the 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 the, the person that people can ask questions to. Other developers come to you and they ask uh, questions. Uh, no. The developers have to have some security. Uh, ah, okay, good. Uh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. They transformed you into knowing stuff about security as a developer, putting stuff on top of your plate. Definitely going to talk about that. Um, who's, in, who's in the financial industry here? Who serves as a consultant in financials or who's an employee within financial? In, okay. Uh, telecom? Oh, less. Okay. Uh, healthcare? Oh, oh, oh okay. <laughs> Uh, who's within a security company? Well, I think the, most of the consultants here are, are within a security company. Okay. Um, healthcare, what, what, do I, what, what am I missing here? IT, maybe IT companies. Um, any other organizations like, like uh, oil and gas or stuff like that? Military? No, industrial organization, Chicago. Ah, okay, okay. Um, well, maybe I forgot government. Who's working in government? Ah, okay, yeah. But other than that, no, not a lot of, okay, security in, at the government, not uncommon. Um, company size-wise, like, like who's within organizations, like, uh, I would say between 100 and 1,000. Who's, okay, because normally, oh, not, not a lot. I thought that would be the bulk of the people. Less than 100? Oh, smaller organizations. And more than 1,000? And for you, guys, <laughs> for you guys, is it even more than 1,000 developers or really, like, more than 1,000 people? Yeah, yeah, okay. All right, so thanks a lot. Um, that, that gives you a little bit like who's in here. And, and um, that's something I, I always like to do because it, it then at least we know each other a little bit like, hey, who's working where and, and what kind of audience do we have? So security is, ev is everywhere, right? And we can talk about a lot of things. Um, we can talk about endpoint security. Uh, we can talk about uh, uh, network security. Over here, I definitely want to talk about application security, not about malware, viruses, and all that kind of stuff, but really like, hey, what does a developer do? And mainly, um, a developer will unintentionally create problems into the code, right? If you don't teach a developer how to avoid stuff like SQL injection, cross-site scripting, he will unintentionally make problems into the code. So that's really what, what I would like to talk about. Um, so not really about flaws today. I do not want to talk about architectural problems. I really want to talk about bugs into code. Um, I, I, for, for fun of it, to start with, I looked up like um, what were the coding problems that were the most expensive coding problems. Um, I, I found the Ariane 5 rocket, um, 7 billion. I thought that was pretty, pretty big. Um, what I tried to do over there was cram a 64-bit number into a 16-bit uh, space. That doesn't work, of course, so instead of moving forward, it went backwards at, at a certain point in time, and they had to explode the rocket, um, 7 billion lost. Maybe closer to the financial industry, Knight Capital, maybe you've heard about that. Um, what they tried to do over there was uh, updating their servers across the board. Somebody made a coding problem in there, and they lost 440 million in, in a 30-minute time span. Um, eventually, they had to quickly sell the company to not go bankrupt. So can you really screw up with code? I think these two examples um, assure you that you can screw up with code. So let's start with the beginning, finding problems. Um, I think there's no shortage in finding problems in code. Within your organization, um, you will find a ton of problems in there through static analysis, through getting hacked, through white hat hackers, through penetration testing, through peer code review. So I quickly would like to run over these. Um, and the first things that I, uh, first stories that, that I uh, looked up was really like, hey, um, people are, are companies that got hacked, but through coding problems, through SQL injection. We see a lot of these problems, like I, I gave you the Ariana problem and, and Knight Capital problem. That was not through SQL injection. That was some sort of a coding problem. But through SQL injection, VTech uh, had a problem where they, they, they said, like, they, VTech is a toy manufacturer, right? Um, so they make toys, and with the Internet of Things, they said, like, hey, we really we cannot miss that particular boat. We really have to get everything connected. So they quickly moved on, and they tried to get everything connected, and they re didn't really pay attention. Um, so they were vulnerable to SQL injection. Um, what was the bad thing over there? Well, the good thing was... They stole the database with the usernames and passwords. The passwords were hashed in the proper way, so it was all good. 
Um, unfortunately for them, next to the username and the hashed password were also the security questions and the answer in, in clear text. So that was not really good coding practice or not good practice. Um, Yahoo, we all know the story about Yahoo. They got hacked. 400,000 usernames and passwords and email addresses were, were leaked. Um, Sony, same thing, same thing through SQL injection. That was their way in. Coding problem, that was their way in. Um, so they exploited the SQL injection. Eventually, they got to 180 Excel files. And again, the same thing. It contains all their usernames and passwords in, in plain text. Um, but their way in was really through SQL injection. So we ha if you have something like that, you know of a problem. It may take a little while to figure out where the problem really is, what their entry point was. Um, but you, as a company, become aware of a problem. Peer code review. Um, for developers, I think they all do peer code review. Uh, you can also do it for security, right? You can also do peer code review for security. Um, the, the unfortunate thing is there are so many problems that you have to be aware of that it is very hard to do peer code review for security, right? When you start doing code review for security, it may look something like that. Um, but it is very, very hard to, f to be knowledgeable about all the particular problems that... that can happen in code. Static analysis. Static analysis. Um, I think it's a pretty mature market. Uh, companies around there, like the ones that I that I worked for, uh, are around for for ten years. So it's pretty mature. The, these these tools work well. Um, there's not a ton of prob. There's still problems in there, but it's not like overwhelming. The number of problems that are in these solutions, they are very mature. Um, and, and even though that they work very, very well, they find a ton of stuff and it's still very hard to get everything fixed. So first of all, what's static analysis? Static analysis is looking at the code without executing the code. So where before we say like, hey, you can do peer code review, we can look at each other's code. Static analysis does the same thing. It looks at code without executing the code and it try to, tries to find problems in the code. All right, so no execution at all. Just trying to figure out from a theoretical perspective, can something go wrong with your code? That is static analysis. All right. Um, so what you have to know about static analysis, um, these frameworks are generic frameworks. If you buy into static analysis, um, you need to do some customization for your technology, for your applications. Not a lot of people know that, but you have to do that. Um, it, it's not a click of a button and everything will magically show up and all problems will show up. No, it's, it's not like that. You need customization. Uh, sorry, give me one second. All right. The opposite of, of static analysis is penetration testing, automated solutions. Um, so you really run the application and you try to hack into the application. Um, by automated means. So, for example, we can talk about fuzzers where we send random streams of information to the application and we see if the application goes down. If we want to make it a little bit more smarter, we talk about penetration testing solutions where um, you really know about certain attack vectors that work well to find particular problems and you're going to attack the application. Um, so, static analysis is a really good way to make sure that people are aware of the pro oh, sorry did I say second so penetration testing solutions automated runtime solutions are, are a really good way to start a software security initiative to prove that something is wrong with your application um, it is not a really good way to rely on only this, these particular things for application security so um, you, you cannot like say we can we go we're only going to require on penetration testing for software security within, within our organization. That would be a little bit cynical, I think, because um, if you don't train or if you don't inform your developers on how to write secure code, and then after the fact you're going to do a penetration test, um, it, it will not work. Of course, you will find problems. It was never developed with security in mind, right? It's like you you ask a person to build a race bike and once he's done you're going to put it over there and say let's see if somebody can steal that race bike well of course he can steal that race bike nobody ever um, made a description of all the security features that needed to be in there he was not aware of that kind of use case of, of that kind of scenario white hat hackers um, 
Well, we all know we, know, we all know about white hat hackers, right? Um, so essentially, they get rewarded, uh, especially around bug bounty programs. They get rewarded to find problems in code. It all started with uh, Netscape, 1995. Um, a little bit of weird thing, I think. White hat hackers. You ask random people, like, "Hey, can you hack into my software and please tell me what what you've done?" It's like, "Hey, I have a house. Um, I've secured it." somewhat and now I'm gonna say hey can you to random people can you break into my house um, I I may be looking I may not be looking I don't know um, but in the end can you tell me what you've done and and what you've stolen out of my house it's it's a little bit weird um, I saw recently a discussion on, on LinkedIn where a guy said like hey um, I, I submitted a, a particular problem to a company and they didn't uh, give me credit when they published it. Luckily, I have two other problems I have not reported yet. Are you a white hat hacker at that point? Um, not really, right? Black hat hackers, they sell their stuff on the black market. And I think um, Zerodium is, is a kind of company that turns turned the world upside down in a sense that normally it's underground, you sell to the highest bidder. What they've done is they made really a chart like, hey, this is what we're going to pay you if you find a particular problem because we can sell it to, they claim, Western governments. So it, it is really a chart where you say, hey, I'm going to find a, an exploit for, for example, iPhone. It's a zero day. I will get paid up to one million. Or a zero day for Android. Um, I will get paid somewhere. So they really turned the world upside down. Another organization that tried to do that was a hacking team. They also did something very similar. And they said, hey, we're only going to sell to Western government, governments, uh, not repressive regimes. Unfortunately, they got hacked, and there was clear proof that um, they did sell to repressive regi regimes. So I think in the end, there's a ton, a ton of stuff, a ton of problems you can find in your organization. And now that you've found them, uh, you may ask yourself, like, hey, how can we fix them? All right, so we found them. We have to transfer them from security, from software security to uh, the development organization. And I think um, between developers and, and security, there's sometimes a miscommunication, right? Um, and it, I think it has a little bit to do with um, how we are. Um, developers are under a lot of stress. They need to deliver fast. They, they are result driven. They know what the feature needs to do. Um, not from a security perspective, they know what the functional requirements are and they need to deliver this as, as fast as possible. Um, so they really have a focus on what they need to deliver. But they are very, very knowledgeable about the, the software, about the functionality, about everything that that particular feature can do. Security, they, they're always worried, right? Um, even, even if they're not in their organization and they leave their car, they're, they're threat modeling their car, like, hey, how can it, can it be stolen today, my particular car? So they don't want to move that fast. They have to move fast, but sometimes they prefer to have a sound solution over having a fast solution right now. Um, and they know a lot about security, but not always a lot about the application, the technology stack that is used within a particular organization. So there's, there's sometimes a bridge between um, or, or a gap, I'm sorry, a gap between security and, and the development. And we have to try to bridge that particular gap. So in a lot of organizations, there's, there's a process in place. Um, it's, it's quite a heavy process where you find a problem, but then um, you need to find a problem, you need to check the problem, you need to submit the problem to a bug tracking system. Somebody has to find the solution, which is always quite tricky. Who's finding the solution for a particular problem? Is that the security person, or does that need to be the developer? That's where that gap really comes into place. Security person says, like, hey, it's SQL injection. You have to fix that one. And the developer is like, right, SQL injection. And then he has to Google stuff, and he has to train himself and learn about SQL injection to get something fixed. But normally, there's, there's, a, there's a process in place. Um, it, it's a bumpy process. They have to code it. Once they find a solution, they have to code the solution. Um, they have to test the solution, they have to verify the solution, they have to put it in production, that particular solution. So it, it's, in a lot of organizations, it, it's, a, it's a heavy, heavy pr process. Um, and next to the technical issues, um, so next to the technical issues, there, there, there has to be a process. They have to get time assigned to do that kind of stuff. 
And if you look at the number of solutions that are out there these days to help really developers, um, I, I couldn't find a single solution that really helps the developers these days in, in a detailed way and say, hey, I'm going to help you on a day-to-day -day basis with, with writing secure code. Um, there's a lot of solutions for finding problems for security. So there's, there's static analysis, there's and all the solutions that I just enumerated are there to find problems in your code. And there's, a, there's even solutions like, like ThreatFix to classify all these solutions and categorize them and prioritize them and get them into the bug tracking system. Um, but it eventually comes down to the developer. The developer has to fix these solutions. Um, and if, if you do that, if you say developer fix these solutions, um, I think today what we're really doing is, is we find a problem and you want a developer to fix that problem one by one. Okay? So it, it's not a generic solution out there that keeps everything safe. We find, for example, a SQL injection problem. We're going to say, hey, you developer, fix that one particular SQL injection problem. What we really would like to do is make sure that they always do the same things. You know, we, we have to put some guidelines into place where we say, hey, um, you know, if, if you use concatenation, that, that's pretty bad. Always use parameterized queries. Um, even if you, if you know or don't know if something, something can go wrong, no, just like always use parameterized queries. And if you do that, you're always going to be safe. So on the left hand, what we do today is, is really point and shoot security. We find a problem, we ask them to fix a problem, and it, 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 it doesn't lead to um, a good coding practices where somebody always does the same thing for all these security or potential security problems out there. On the right hand side, we, we really what we would like to move to is really security by design. A developer always has to do the same things over and over again, and he is he's always going to be right. And now I come to my one, one coding example here. Um, it, it, it's still very uh, high level, but this is the, the, what it boils down to. This is, I think, what the problem is these days on how we approach application security. For example, you use a static analysis solution or, or a, a penetration testing solution or anything that can point out problems. And when we run that particular solution, it's going to say, hey, you know what? I'm 100% I'm, I'm sure that parameter 1 and parameter 2 are vulnerable to SQL injection. All right. Parameter 3, I'm like, I, I don't really know. It may or it may not be vulnerable to SQL injection. And the last one, um, I'm confident you're fine. It's, you don't, it's not vulnerable. So what are, your, what are you, from the application security side, what are you going to ask your developer to do right now? And this really depends on your organization, right? And a lot of organizations, they're going to say, well, the first two, you need to fix them. You need to use parameterized queries. The third one, we're going to ask QA if they can find an exploit, if it's really a problem. And the fourth one, it's, it's fine. We don't have to do anything here. Um, so I think this, this really shows the problem, right? We do not ask the developer to always do the same things over and over again. And knowing if this particular uh, parameter is vulnerable to SQL injection is essentially irrelevant. It's, it's a waste of time. If you, if you just fix that one, you're sure that it, nothing can go wrong. All right? So... This is not what we do today. This is definitely not what we do today. We find problems, we fix problems one by one. This is, of, of course, a, a very blunt example, but you can find problems like these at organizations where they really say, fix the first one and the second one. The third one, we're going to try to find an exploit or we're going to look more careful into that one. And the last one, well, well, we're good. Although it's not really good coding practices, we're good, so don't don't fix it because it's code that, that's running forever. Um, it is fine, so don't, don't touch it. Um, same is true when you do outsourcing. Um, you, new developers come on board, you're going to do the same thing again. You're going to check their code and you're going to say, well, oh, you cannot do this and you cannot do that uh, because it's, it's problematic. Fix these particular problems and not the ones that are particularly safe. So um, assume that you get a process in place where you fix all the problems that you found in your organization. So um, with all the bugs that you found, you got time assigned as a developer, and there are no more problems in your code. All right. 
unfortunately, you keep on introducing new problems, right? Like solutions like static analysis, they can find up to 700 different categories of problems. 700. So SQL injection is one. Cross-site scripting is another one. There are 698 other problems or categories of problems that you can introduce in your code. Um, so how can you make sure that your developer does not make these mistakes? And, and one obvious solution I always hear, but we train our developers. Um, they are trained very well on, on software security. Um, that is possible, but like, did you train them on all 700 categories? Well, normally you train them on the top X, the top, the WASP top 10, for example, and, and you hope you're good, you know, because these are the most problematic things in code or things that a developer can make. But if you do training, the odds are a little bit against us, I think, because Within 24 hours, 70% is forgotten. Within a week, 90% is forgotten, and you hope they remember the good parts, but that's not always true. Normally, what you remember from a training is a good story, like, hey, these companies got hacked, and this is how they got hacked, and look how bad their security was. Um, if you want to do this right, it is very expensive, uh, because you have to tailor it to the technology. Um, to, to put it very blunt, if you train somebody or you explain something in Java and he's writing PHP all day long, it doesn't make sense, right? So you really have to tailor to it to the technology stack, to the libraries that somebody is using. So if you want to do it right, you have to customize it towards your developers and it's very expensive. Um, for, for training, I'm always wondering like, hey, um, if you train somebody right now on cryptography and this is like really a one-off, right? And next year he has to do something with crypto. Will, will he remember? Probably not. Probably he will just use Google. And from a security perspective, I think we all knew, know that Google is not our friend. The top hits are normally not the right things from a security perspective. So there's, there's sometimes a, a time difference between when you know something about security and when you really have to apply that uh, into your own code. I, and, and the last one is actually a really good one where, um, in my philosophy, do you really want to turn a developer into a security person? Um, by the end of the day, if there are 700 categories and you really want to make sure that person does not make any security mistakes, um, you're going to essentially burn a lot of his time teaching him about security, uh, reminding him about certain categories, refresher trainings, um, finding bugs, fixing bugs, security problems. So. By the end of the day, um, he's no longer a developer where he will enjoy creating features. Um, he will be more spending more time thinking always about the security. And that may be a good thing, but maybe that's not really what he wants to do. That's not really what he's paid for. He's paid to deliver features. And, and last but not least is um, if you really fix all problems, um, is your code secure at that point? Um, and if you do point and shoot, uh, fixes for security problems, I think um, for sure it's not going to be secure. You're only, only going to fix the problems that you found. Um, there's still going to be other problems because you never ever introduced some, some robust and consistent, consistent programming methods into your organization. So next question that I have is like, hey, okay, so if, if there is nothing that can help that particular developer, what can we do to help a particular developer? And, and you all remember that one. The developer has to fix it. So how can we help the developer? Um, and it, Well, you can try to scale your application security team where you say, hey, um, we're gonna, we are very interactive with our developers. Um, uh, we have a, a secure, an application security team, and if the developers have questions, they always can come to us, and we're going to help them out. Um, that's all very nice, but I think, again, the odds are against us in terms of uh, the talent. Um, uh, you guys are all very lucky with your job right now in the sense that um, if, if there's a, a particular area in IT where you can make a lot of money, it's actually security because there's such a big shortage in security. Um, if you think about, if, if there, there's actually numbers about that. Uh, Ponemon Institute says like, hey, 40% of IT security positions are, were vacant in 2014. Um, there's going to be a private sector shortfall of 1.5 million in 2020 in IT security. Um, and, and one interesting number that I found was like, hey, um, if you really want to serve as the application security team, your developers, 
Um, there's only very, very few of them that have has to serve a lot of developers, less than two people per hundred developers, according to BSIM. Um, so you essentially want to go to battle. You want to uh, make sure that your code is secured and you want to go to battle and, and half of your troops are, are missing. So um, that's not a good starting point for you as an organization. And it's only going to become worse, right? Um, while it is true that fixing problems early on in the cycle is, is really cost effective, you, you have to try to work with, um, this is a chart from, from aspect security that outlines like, hey, how much does it cost to fix a problem in your code? A little bit, the numbers are a little bit artificial, but I think the general concept is really the later you find a problem, the more it costs to fix that particular problem. So the earlier you can find a particular problem, um, the less expensive it becomes for you as an organization to not introduce a particular problem in your code. So if we can even move earlier on, if we can sit next to the developer and make sure as an AppSec team or group to, to not make mistakes in the first place, um, you can even reduce that number to close to nothing, of course. I'll skip this one. Um, last couple slides that I have is, is around... Um, the developer angle to security. So right now, as application security, what we're doing right now is when we teach something to developers, we always are inclined to talk about all the bad stuff that can happen. Um, when we talk about SQL injection, we're first going to say, hey, SQL injection is bad. It's, it's a particular problem with this or that. But you're going to say, hey, this is bad because, hey, everybody can steal your database. Um, this is an attack vector on how they can do it. And you're going to outline really the problematic things. You're going to teach somebody, the developer, about all the things that can go wrong. All right. Um, you're not going to tell, or eventually you're going to tell a developer how to fix that particular problem. But we always start by telling them what all the bad things that can happen because of their coding mistake. Um, while a developer may not always be interested in that. A developer wants to get his job done. He wants to really code in a good way. Um, he doesn't care about all the things that can go wrong. Just tell me what I have to do and I'll do it. Right? Um, so, so maybe a, a better angle would be if an AppSec person tries to talk to a developer to make sure that's in a format or into a language that a developer can understand. Um, talk to him about like, hey, this is what you should do and make it actionable, make it applicable to his particular code. Um, really make something that a developer can immediately consume. If there is something like SQL injection that you want to explain to a developer, just tell him like, use parameterized queries. Done. Use parameterized queries. Always use parameterized queries. If he does that, he's going to be fine. Right? You don't have to tell him, like, hey, you know what, um, there's, there's Sony, just the stuff that I did in the beginning, there's Sony, they got hacked, and they, their database got leaked because concatenation, and they didn't do input validation, and all that kind of stuff. Developer that wants to get his job done is not always that interested in all these aspects of, of security. He, o he only wants to know, like, tell me what I should do, and I'll do it, and I'll move on, and I'll make my feature. That's what a developer wants to do. All right? So maybe a better paradigm for us as, as application security people is to learn to speak a, a, the language of a developer. Tell him what to do and, and not always try to elaborate on all the things that can go wrong. And I think there's a lot of measurement going on in, in application security. There's a lot, of, a lot of pie charts, all kind of charts that we can draw about how good we are within our organization about software security. Um, out of all these um, metrics, I'm, I'm actually all, only interested in two of them, is like how many problems got you fixed and how many vulnerabilities did you not introduce into your code. And um, of course, this is a very hard one to, to measure, but you can actually. You can actually measure something like that. You can measure how many problems you, you got fixed and you can actually measure how many problems you did not introduce into your code. And I think that, that are very um, interesting metrics to, to look at right now and to see if these improve over, over time. And that's actually the end of, of my talk. So um, thank you very much uh, for, for your attention. Any questions around my talk? <laughs> <laughs> Any questions? No. 
Yes? So what's the technical balance between static analysts and uh, having a physical person? Okay. So, so what, essentially what the static analysis solution is, is a combination of all people's knowledge. Um, so the way you create the static analysis solution is, is you have one kind of analysis mechanism and you have a lot of different people knowing about different subjects. Like somebody in the very beginning, let's say somebody knew about SQL injection and he figured out SQL injection, he can put that into a static analysis solution. So that static analysis, analysis solution can find a SQL injection problem. Um, somebody figures out cross-site scripting, you can put that into a static analysis solution. So um, essentially, static analysis solution is doing the exact same thing as, as doing peer code review for security, but it's just a, a, a knowledge-based system, a combination of all people's knowledge. Any other questions? All right. Thank you. Thank you.